Hey Physics 1 and 2, this is Mr. Neff and let's talk electromagnetic induction and Lenz's law. So last time in class I was talking about, uh, through, the, through uh, motional EMF, I was talking about the, uh, the voltage that you can induce in a circuit that doesn't have a battery in it. This uh, is induced in the circuit by changing the magnetic flux uh, through a coil through that, that area of the circuit. It gives you a battery-like effect, even though there's no real battery there. And how can you determine how strong this battery is? Well, you can see, and then this is what we determined last time, that the amount of EMF induced is equal to the negative of the number of coils of wire in the loop times the rate of change of the magnetic flux. Now I can show this with the simulator. Some people think mistakenly that a battery is, uh, can be replaced by a magnet. That's not true. A magnet can give you a battery-like effect, but I can't just take the magnet and just sit it here. You see, I got no light. You see, I've got no voltage. But if I take the magnet and I move it, that is, I can change how much field is going through this area. That is, how much flux is going through that area. Is there flux there right now? Yes, but there's no changing flux. And so you can see you're getting a lot of nothing. But if I can take this magnet and I can change the amount of flux, imagine the field here. Now the field coming out of this north, side, north pole of the magnet will be pointing away because as we know, we could fill this area with compasses and it would be pointing away kind of like this, kind of like this, kind of like this if I were drawing field vectors. Right now, a certain amount of those field lines are going through this coil, and some of them aren't. If I move it closer, now more of those field lines went through the coil and less of them missed. And if I move it farther away, now more and more of them are missing as I move it away, and less and less of them are hitting. If your imagination's not good, the programmers of this made it so that you could see the field lines, and now watch. Right now I have four field lines going into the coil, but if I move it closer, I have eight. And if I move it farther away again, I have four. And so as you can see, as I change the amount of field lines, the, the flux is changing and look at the light bulb lighting up back and forth, back and forth. It's a little bit hidden under my picture here, but there's a feature that lets you spin the magnet. And if I spin the magnet, now, even though I'm not changing the number of field lines, I'm changing the direction of the magnetic field's vector. And so magnetic field pointing to the left is not the same as magnetic field to the right. And so even though the total numbers of field lines are the same, left and right are not the same. And I'm getting light and I'm getting flow. Notice something that whenever I go from the north being close to the south being close, I get a voltage that's, they're calling it positive. And whenever I do the opposite, I get a voltage that's being called negative. Now, all of that is very good. Let's try an example. There we go. Let's try an example of Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Here's one from the book that I think we can get a lot out of. So you can see here, a uh, magnetic field is going through a stationary wire loop. And the magnitude of the field is changing as a function of time. So sort of like what I was just showing in that simulator. Uh, from, from the beginning of this, there's no field going through the loop. And then the field is, is uh, getting stronger and stronger. Maybe there's more and more field lines going through the loop, uh, what have you. Maybe you're moving that magnet closer. Somehow, through the loop, you're making a stronger and stronger field. Okay, and then for a while, you're maintaining it at a certain strength, and then you're reducing the strength down. Now, they say that the, the uh, direction of the field remains constant, and there are th uh, three equal time intervals, three three-second time intervals. The loop has 50 turns of wire, so that means that N will be 50. And there's the area of the loop. 
magnetic field is oriented parallel to the normal of the loop, meaning that the field is pointing in the same direction as the area vector. And so we know that flux is a dot product, but we will not have to worry about the cosine of phi, the cosine of zero. We know will just be one, and we won't mention that anymore. And so it says for each interval, determine the induced EMF. Okay, so as I know, the induced EMF is the opposite of the number of turns of wire times the rate of change of the flux. And so here, the rate of change of the flux is the N times the flux final, B dot A final, minus the B dot A initial, divided by the time. Now, I can see that the A is staying a constant, and so I can factor that A out, and I will go down here, and I will say that this is the induced EMF is a negative N times the area times the B minus B naught all over the time. Okay, so the number of turns is 50. The area is 0.15 square meters. The final minus the initial field is going to be 0.4 minus 0. And we're going to divide by the time of three seconds that that took. And when you run those numbers, you end up getting a value of negative one volt. So that says that if we had this loop and it had 50 turns in it, but there was also a, a resistor or a uh, just a wire with some resistance in it, the current would flow uh, it with an amount based on Ohm's law. So here I have my loop and say I go around 50 times and just to symbolize it, I have a resistor down there. If the, if I knew that that resistance was 0.5 ohms and the, the induced voltage here is negative one volt, then I know that the current is gonna be the voltage divided by the resistance easy negative one volt divided by the resistance of 0.5 uh, ohms and that's going to give me it's going to give me negative two ampere now the negative is is just saying uh, in one direction or the other you're going to see in the next part of this example that the uh, sign comes out the other way I, the way i have this drawn i don't really know which side would be negative and which side would be positive but i will if I were careful about the, the drawing and so forth, maybe I'd be able to actually say uh, this flows to the right or this flows to the left. Now, for the second part, it's basically the same thing, except if you notice, there's only half as much change in the same amount of time. And so for the second part, rather than 0.4 and 0, I'm going to have a final amount of 0.2 and an initial amount of 0.4. You might be thinking, well, what about the second one? Why did you skip the second one? And I can especially see someone saying, why did you skip the second one? That's where the field was very nice and strong. So why didn't we have a voltage there? Well, remember, it's not about having a field. It's about having a changing field. And for that second part, you see that I didn't have any change at all. So I don't disagree that it was that it was strong. It was the strongest of the whole the whole nine seconds for that middle three seconds. But it's not going to give you any voltage because there's no change. So since we have half as much change here and a negative sign at that, no one will be surprised when we get the opposite sign and half as much, half as much voltage here. And so if I were to put half as much voltage in there, of course, I would get half as much current. Notice too that I'm going to have a positive rather than a negative whichever direction the negative two indicated across that resistor maybe it was to the left maybe it was to the right the 
the positive one ampere will be the other. Let's talk Lenz's law for just a little bit now. And Lenz said that the nature is always going to try to cancel out the change. And so these effects that we're going to get are nature's attempt at canceling out the change. And the canceling out part is why all of that can be summarized as just a negative sign before the, the uh, equation. Take a look at this example. Here we have a current in a wire that's steadily increasing as time goes by. And we say that this is going to induce a current in a rectangular loop. We know this is true because if the current increases as time goes by, so if I showed you a graph of current versus time, whether it's uh, something like this or whether it's an exponential or anything that just keeps getting more and more, we know that there's going to be more and more field around this too. Now we also know that, that uh, the field around a current carrying wire is going to be some concentric circles that, that go around in the direction that the right hand rule predicts. So I'm gonna grab that wire with my thumb, the, my th thumb of my right hand pointing in the direction of the, the current. And now my fingers are going around such that on the, this left side, my fingers are coming out of the page. That's true, but not really relevant to this problem. And then on the left side, my fingers are going into the page. Maybe pause the video and convince yourself that that's the case. Okay, and if I wanted to really describe this whole area of field, I could say uh, yeah, that field lines would go out and they would get less and less close as you go because they, the field is getting weaker and weaker. All that is true. But of all of what I've just drawn, the only thing that really matters is that one X that I drew inside of the loop. Now, as time goes by, X's are going to be drawn all over the place on this right side, right? More and more X's because the current's getting stronger and the field's getting stronger. But all that really matters is what's inside of that loop. Notice too, that the inside of the loop is just empty space. And so one might be tempted to say, well, that doesn't matter. Well, it turns out it does matter. And the more filled lines that are going into that empty space is creating flux. And flux is something that, that nature doesn't like the change of. And so what nature's going to do is she's going to introduce a current that will create a field to cancel that out. So I sort of think of the effect and then get the cause from it. And so there's X's appearing over here as the current increases. And so I, I want to, me speaking as, as nature, I want to try to cancel out those X's. Remember an X is really a vector that's pointing away from us. And so to cancel out a vector that's pointing away from us, I put in a vector that's pointing towards us and that's gonna be a dot. Now that's the effect. The current that goes around this loop is gonna be the cause of that effect. And so which way would that go? Take your thumb of your right hand and point it straight out of the page at you. And look how your fingers go, point the fingers of your right hand, go around the loop in a counterclockwise way. And so if my thumb's pointing out, my fingers are gonna point around this way. And that's the current that nature induces because of this, because of this increasing field. We have a few more examples. We'll continue those on the next video.